Well, we've got something very exciting for you this morning. We're going to start off today with a panel of experts who are going to share some terrific research related to play and how we can make sure we get all kids to get the play they need to thrive. Okay, <laughs> trust me on this. Th this is gonna be the most exciting research that you've ever heard. Uh, we've got th uh, three great presentations for you, and this is all about action-oriented research. This isn't about just looking to the past and hoping that what we did made a difference. It's about figuring out how together we can use data to drive the best decision-making and to do the best so that we can get the results that we want to see in communities. And to kick it off this morning, we've got Dr. Bob Block, who many of you met yesterday. He's the past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and he's going to be talking to us about the connection between toxic stress and play. And uh, it's a terrific way to start because it really reinforces how for us at Kaboom, our mission is about making sure that the 16 million kids growing up in this country get the play that they need to thrive. And when you're growing up in extreme adversity, uh, those are the kids we're trying to serve most. And Dr. Block is going to reference that uh, when he talks about the research related to th uh, toxic stress. So Dr. Block, please come up. Well, good morning, everybody, and it is obviously a great pleasure for me to be here today and represent the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the 62,000 members, pediatricians across the country, and the work that we're hoping to be able to do in our new center on healthy, resilient children, which we're developing at the Academy. The center is going to be a place for partnerships, uh, for partnering with you and, and with other folks to try and look at the continuing evolution of the science about toxic stress uh, and to look at resiliency and to find out how we together can create uh, more resiliency in our children, particularly among those who are exposed uh, to stress at levels that otherwise are going to be damaging to their brain. So, I want to start out with play rather than ending up with play. Play, as you can see, is the connector between the developing child and her or his brain, her or his body, and the soul of the child. The soul of the child is going to become the soul of an adult, right? Because every adult was once a child. And that's a message that sounds very, very simple, but is one that is really important for folks that we all deal with in our various walks of life every day. Because in pediatrics, we really see ourselves as establishing with our patients the predictors of their lifelong and adult health. Play is a really vital element in the eco-biodevelopmental model of what happens with children as they evolve into later ages, and we'll come back to that at, at the very end. Play stimulates the beginning of optimal brain health. Now, I want to share with you a bias of mine, and it is demonstrated by this picture, not that one, but that one, um, which may be a little bit difficult to see with the lighting, but that is a headless horseman. Happy Halloween. But the Headless Horseman is the only person that I know who carries his brain and his head around with him disjointed from the rest of his body. <laughs> the rest of us, our brains and our heads are connected, right? So why do we have a term called mental health? Why do we have a department of health and a department of mental health and substance abuse? That makes absolutely no sense. And one of the things that we need to do is to begin to incorporate uh, the term, or at least the thinking, about brain health as it relates to not only toxic stress, but to the features and factors that create resiliency in kids. Because mental health has a stigma, it has an, in, um, an uneven access to health care, uh, and it's very difficult for physicians to get paid to deal with mental health issues. If I deal with a child who has a developmental issue in my office and I send in the little form for the insurance company to pay me, they send it back and they say, we're not going to pay you for this. It's not health. This is mental health. And we don't pay for mental health on any parity with the rest of what's going on. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So let's look at a little bit of what we know about neurobiology as it relates to stress. There are two or three very important areas. 
the HPA axis, which means that the brain uh, and uh, the hypothalamic area of the brain, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland located far away from the brain are all connected. They're connected also through the adrenergic nervous system. And what happens is brain structure and function is related to the interaction of all of these different hormones and uh, biological features. We have evolving science on that now, and that is the science that connects brain health to body health and makes everything, I would hope, uh, on an even keel. So what are we talking about? When we're talking about stress, we're talking about environmental stressors, we're talking about major life events, we're talking about trauma and abuse, and we're talking about individual reactions to that that vary from one child to the other, just like they do one adult to the other. And you either arrive at allostasis, which is like homeostasis, which means you're back on an even keel, or you do not adapt pretty well, and then you have what we call an allostatic load, meaning that there's just too much stress for the body to accommodate. So let me show you quickly a picture of you today uh, and perhaps yesterday. This is our normal response to stress. So you wake up and you've overslept for an hour, you miss the bus. Uh, if you're at home, uh, the kids aren't cooperating, uh, the washing machine overflowed, whatever it is, and your stress level goes way up. But it comes back down because you are able to achieve allostasis. And then the next day or so it goes back up and then it comes back down. That's the normal function and kids who are learning how to handle stress also have that normal kind of function. And that amount of stress and even, maybe even a little bit more called tolerable stress uh, is good for kids to learn how to deal with that. But this is not good. This is what happens to children who are, are neglected, who are maltreated, who have uh, other environmental uh, uh, problems, and they have toxic stress, which does not go away. Uh, there's a difference between traumatic stress, which is an event that happens, and ongoing, relenting trauma, which is toxic stress. So infants and young children have this sense, and this was where attachment theory came from. They have this sense that it's their fault when things go wrong, and they, we have to help them learn how to relate to their parents and parents' availability, parents' uh, sensitivity to the needs of children so that they can adapt to stress. And when they do that, they do it either through those mechanisms that I talked to you about before or through uh, mechanisms tied to their genes, because you can change your DNA and your destiny through uh, an experience with toxic stress. So epigenetics is the term that we use for that. And the reason I like to put this slide up is to prove to you all that I can say epigenetics. <laughs> we don't have time this morning to talk about that in detail, but I'm, I'm happy when we have breaks to, to explain that further. But I suggest everybody learn at least basics of what we mean about how our genes are expressed or not expressed, depending on the genome's reaction to stress, particularly toxic stress. When we did the ACE studies, or when folks did the ACE studies, we learned that adverse childhood experiences move up that pyramid, uh, and you move towards uh, adoption of health risk behaviors, you move toward diseases and early mortality, as well as significant morbidity, all of which, or at least a good part of which, could be prevented if we paid attention during uh, a child's early lifespan. Play. Play facilitates attachment. It facilitates attachment of the child to other children, uh, attachment of the child to the parents and family, attachment of a child later on to school, to neighborhood, and, and eventually to community. Play teaches problem solving. Play teaches creativity. Play actually works biologically to counteract the effects of that toxic stress that we were talking about. And that leads us to the eco-biodevelopmental Oop, you don't get to see that yet. Eco-biodevelopmental model. Ecology is the environment that a child lives in. Uh, so when I was teaching with, with pediatric residents and they'd come to me with a diagnosis of a child, particularly a behavioral diagnosis, which by the way occurs depending on whose figures you believe, somewhere between 17 and 30 percent of all children that we see in pediatrics have a brain health issue. Uh, and that ecology uh, often, uh, when explored, can explain symptoms that otherwise would be ascribed to either some disease or to, I don't know, but here's how I'm going to treat it anyway. Now we can know. Uh, this is the environment of the family, the neighborhood, the community, what support uh, the child may have, access to health care, which is and in this country is not as available for children as it is in other more enlightened countries. Uh, the bio part is new discoveries daily that we're talking about here that link the health uh, over the lifespan to what's happening with children and how they set their body.
biological clocks. And by the way, there are two critical periods. One is early in life, have the first thousand days or the first two years, or the first three years, the first five years, whatever rings your bell is fine with me. But there's another critical period that runs from about 12 or 13 to 24. And that's the time when brains begin to develop the ability to make decisions. And yes, that means that if you're asking kids to make decisions before their early adolescence, they may struggle with that some, particularly if they've not had models on how to do that without creating uh, additional stress. And my timekeeper disappeared, so where am I? A perfect. The biological part are the new discoveries that if we had an hour and a half, we could go through in more detail as we're learning how the body and the brain together adjust to um, the stresses that it's experiencing and developing resiliency to modify and modulate those stresses to a reasonable level. And then the developmental part is the science that pediatricians have known for a long, long time about human development that emphasize our opportunities now for habilitation and rehabilitation. How often in, in your various programs have you talked about, well, we're going to rehabilitate this family or rehabilitate? Uh, this neighborhood. We can't rehabilitate somebody who hasn't been habilitated in the first place. And one of the things that play can help us do is create this atmosphere of rehabilitation so that they learn how to interact with each other. Five-year-old grandson, shown here in my thank you slide, along with his five-year-old cousin, told me after just three weeks of school, and God bless his kindergarten teacher, uh, we were talking about a little boy in his class, and that little boy was having some problems, and that little boy's problems were interfering with Brennan's ability to pay attention in class. Uh, and we were talking to him about that and said, you know, what, what do we do? Is this little boy a problem for you? And Brennan said, I swear this is the truth, and I'm not bragging on him. I'm talking about children uh, learning how to go through development in a, in a healthy way. He said, you know, when we talk about Johnny, we have to be sensitive to his issues. <laughs> Boy, would I love to take credit for that. But <laughs> so let me leave you with this thought. We have an evolving science that makes sense. If you want to learn more about that, um, buy, buy Robert Sapolsky's book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Uh, he's a neuroscientist from Stanford, uh, and it's a wonderful book that was written for lay people like me to understand the science uh, that was not part of my training. And so now it's part of all of our training, and I hope that this really quick run through lets you know a couple of things. Number one, stress is fine, tolerable stress is okay, toxic stress changes the composition of the brain and the body together and the interactions of the brain with the other organs in the body and it is not good and it causes a significant percentage of brain health issues later on in adolescent and adult life and it causes lung disease, heart disease, it causes uh, cancers, it causes all sorts of diseases for which we've been looking for etiologies uh, over the past several years. So good luck with all of that. Thank you again for the opportunity <laughs> and the Academy is here to help. Thank you, Dr. Block. That was terrific. We have time for one quick question, if anyone has a question. That's a really short question. You, you want to say a few words about that? Sure. The question for everybody was, how do we fix it? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, that gives me another hour or so to uh, be up here. I think we fix it by paying attention to evolving science. Uh, it, the science part is important for pediatricians because we have to get paid for what we do. We can't spend a lot of time otherwise because otherwise we can't have, uh, we can't keep the lights on in, in the offices. So we're trying to convince payers uh, that pediatric time, that the medical home team, which consists of nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants and others, and behavioral health people, brain health people who might be integrated into the practice, can identify these kids and work with them. You can identify these kids in all the different activities that you're doing that we heard about yesterday in those wonderful presentations. You can help by identifying kids who are having difficulty, uh, as you can see, with some of the stressors as they're trying to interact in these play areas. They're trying to interact with other kids or with with adults. We're trying to find ways to screen in a, in a reasonable way to screen for this so that we can identify the kids early, we can get them into some form of treatment which may be nothing more than a really good friend trying to walk them through some of the difficulties in their life. Uh, how do we fix it? There's more to it than that. When do we fix it? It has to be now. How long will it take? Uh, the rest of eternity. <laughs> and on that happy note, thanks Dr. Block. <laughs>